Haul the roll and go. Where am I to go, me Johnny? Where am I to go? For I'm a young and a sailor lad, and where am I to go? Hello, and welcome to Where Am I To Go podcast. Today, before we start the show, I would like to bring up some business things that have kind of been on my mind so that you can know where to get more Where Am I To Go. First off, I'd like to talk about the Facebook page at Where Am I To Go podcast. It's on Facebook, and we've been posting some wonderful pictures of some of the places that we've been and some of the adventures that we've had. Not everything that we go and do is made into a podcast and so we take pictures at different places and post those pictures so that you guys can enjoy some of the different places we've been. Also I really am interested in listener feedback. I have an email address at where am I to go podcast at gmail.com. Again that is where am I to go podcast at gmail.com. I would love to hear some of the listeners' comments and some of their ideas of places that might be interesting to visit and go and do. I'm on kind of a limited travel schedule as far as uh, the way that I travel and where I go, but if there is something extremely interesting, I would definitely do my best to build a trip around it. And the last thing, and, and the latest thing, is that I now have a Patreon account where if you want to hear the podcast early you can go to patreon forward slash lauren alberts sign up for three five ten whatever dollars if you were willing to support what i do and help us with our travel expenses and some of that kind of stuff i would greatly greatly appreciate it but what we're going to do is right now i have several podcasts that are banked i guess you could say I'm on, I think, number 17, 18, 19, somewhere in there, and I've got close to 35 that I have waiting to go out. I only put out about every week because I want to be able to keep a nice steady stream and not have a point in time when we have to shut down like a lot of other podcasts do for season one, season two. I'd like to keep this thing going year-round. And I've been traveling quite a bit and have been hitting quite a few interesting places. We've been to a tattoo museum. We've been to the beach and have gone to several uh, tourist attractions there, an underground tour. We did a cannery tour. We've just done all kinds of things. And I would love for you to be able to hear those early. So if you sign up with the Patreon, as soon as my editor Steve gets these things ready to go out, they will be put up on the Patreon page. And again, I would really appreciate your support. Now that I've got those things out of the way, I hope to hear from you and I hope you keep on listening. And now, let's get on with the podcast. Hello and welcome to Where Am I To Go podcast. Today we are in KC, Wyoming. KC is about halfway between Casper and Buffalo, right off of the interstate. And I am at the Hoof Prints of the West of the past, excuse me, museum. And I am here with Laurel, the curator of this museum. I was here years and years ago. I wanted to come back and see what it was. Casey, Wyoming is a pretty neat little place. I, I was talking to Laurel earlier and I said, uh, everything good, bad, or great in Wyoming, for some reason or another, is centered around KC, from the Johnson County Wars to Chris Ledoux to the Outlaws, and we're going to cover a whole lot of that today. Uh, so, hello, Laurel, and let's take a look at your museum. <laughs> hello, welcome. We try to be a local museum, Southern Johnson County, Western, and KC history specifically, so most of the items that you see here are from this area, and we have a pretty extensive collection of Indian artifacts, uh, points. Uh, this was, of course, one of the last areas where the Indians were able to fight against the U.S. military, and kind of the final defeat of the natives took place just west of town here, about 20 miles west in the Red Fork Valley is where they were defeated in 1876 uh, by, the, by the 
U.S. Army. Now, was this this is before or after Little Bighorn? This is after. This is six months later. So by that time, the the military was fully geared up and fighting the the Crook campaign was here to track down those Indians, and they did at Red Fork Valley, 1876, November, very cold. And that was kind of the final, that was kind of the end of the Indians in this area. It's called the Dull Knife Battle, if you've heard of that. Okay. And uh, so that really was sort of the end of the Indian uprising in the area, and they were basically decimated. Uh, a lot of the, the braves held off the soldiers long enough for the women and children to escape into the mountains, and they had a tremendous hike over the mountains for days to get to friends uh, further friendly tribes to the north and so and now what mountains were they crossing the uh, big horns the big horns, yeah. the big horns. Yeah. and they had to go over the hole in the wall in order to get there no no uh, they, that was uh, that's actually to the north of where the hole in the wall was so they weren't there they okay were, they were close to it they were north of that so okay and now most of the other Indian battles took place north of here correct mm -hmm. yes because a it would a lot of them happened around Sheridan with the Fetterman massacre uh -huh. and yep. and well and with uh, yeah Fort Phil Kearney right Fetterman massacre and then along the Bozeman Trail so east of town we'll go on to the next display areas over here okay now now before we go and and you continue okay. on with this I just want to point out that she has several display cases here that have lots of uh, uh, arrowheads spear points all made out of stone uh, she's got some. Uh, Pestles and and uh, rocks for uh, grinding the grain yep. and some of that type of stuff. She's got some metal points down here that uh, that are, are pointed out a, a pipe. Just a lot of the old uh, Native American uh, artifacts and a very nice display. So, uh, some really neat pieces here, and that looks like a, an actual headdress. Yes, it is. Uh, you don't see you see a lot of the reproductions. You don't see a lot of the original no. uh, headdresses with all the feathers on them and some of that kind of stuff. Okay, now let's move on <laughs> on over here. So we were talking about the Native Americans, the conflicts conflicts with the U.S. military and the whites, and a lot of it was because of the Bozeman Trail. So that ran four miles east of here, and it was mapped out uh, by uh, let's see. Can we take a pause for a minute? Just go ahead. Okay, just go ahead and go. Um, so the Bozeman Trail, 18, let's see, was that 63, I guess, is when they mapped that out. And uh, that brought a flux of people going up to the gold mines up in Montana, and they wanted a cut across. They wanted a shortcut. They didn't want to go over the mountains. And so they knew that it was better and easier to go just along. There's a flat, wide area just to the east of the mountains. That's the best travel rather than to go up to Montana, just right where the interstate is. It's been a traditional travel route for used by natives, by white men for a long time. So uh, this was mapped out by John Bozeman. And of course, this was the last area that was claimed by the Indians. The Sioux claimed it, the Crow claimed it. And so the whites were encroaching on land that had been promised to them. I was going to say it was yeah. broken been, treaty yeah, because, broken treaty. because the treaties of the Black Hills right. covered all of right. this area, correct? So first the U.S. military tried to keep them out. So they basically established themselves in the area to confront the settlers and try to turn them back. Uh, that didn't work. And so then they decided, well, we'll just man the posts and we will let them proceed and we'll just try to keep them safe. And so Fort Reno was built east of town for, it was very short lived. Uh, they ended up basically, but after the Fort Phil Kearney, after the massacre, uh, that kind of ended all, they closed up shop, closed the fort and just kind of gave it back over to the Indians. And so the Bozeman Trail was just in use for a very short time period. Uh, we do have was it fairly to... safe? Well, the military no, was not at all. It was constantly... it was called the Bloody Bozeman. Yes. If I if I they were constantly harassed by the Indians. There were constantly there was a number of small skirmishes out here uh, just east of town. For example, there was something called the Townsend fight. It was a huge wagon train of about 150 wagons led by a man named Townsend, and uh, they were east of town and camped on the river. They had an encounter with Indians where they had fed them and sent them on their way, but they knew it was kind of a trap. They had some guides with them, so they stayed circled up, fortunately, because the Indians did come back. They actually, there was a party out looking for a cow. One thing I've learned from studying history is never go looking for your cow if you are in Indian country, <laughs> because they always die. 
<laughs> so anyways, <laughs> anyways, uh, he, he was killed and they were looking for that man who had gone looking for his cow. And when they were on their way back to the wagon train, they came under attack from the Indians. They managed to get back. One of the men was killed. One of the men was wounded. They did manage to get back inside the train, and they fought off the Indians. And it happened that they were able to hold them off because they were very well armed. Uh, they had some of the new Henry uh, breech-loading rifles, very effective against the Indians. And so they were able to hold them off. The Indians tried to light the grass on fire uh, to stampede the oxen and you know cause a problem. And the women were close to the creek and got water buckets and were able to put it out. Wow. So fortunately, and they were able to wait until the Indians uh, went away, you know, get back, gathered up, and proceeded on. But every party that came through, the first one came through just fine with Jim, uh, John Bozeman. But after that, they were harassed every, every bit of the way, everyone who tried to come through. So they quickly learned this wasn't a very good area. Uh, we do have, prior to that, there was a fort. This was a fur trading area, just like all throughout the West. So that's another aspect of Western history that takes place in this area. and uh, A lot of the early explorers and the mountain men mm -hmm, and, and absolutely. that stuff. And there was an early fort, one of the earliest, the second uh, white man constructed fort in or post or building of some sort. It was a fur trading post established east of here by a man named uh, Antonio Montero. And they call it the Portuguese houses because he came from Portugal. And so it was always just known as the Portuguese houses. It was a Portuguese or the Portuguese fort. And he did, tried to establish a trading post to uh, trade with the natives. It, the, by then, the fur trade was pretty well on the downslope anyways. And then uh, Jim Bridger with his American Fur Company came in and basically kind of ran them out, camped up river, cut all the cottonwood, trapped all the beaver, kind of drove them out in competition. So it was kind of a short-lived venture. Uh, there's still kind of remnants of the fort, but we have a lot of artifacts from that. We have more artifacts from the Portuguese fort than any other museum in the world, which I guess wow. makes sense since we're right here. And you've got a you've got a sword. You've got a look. Uh, yep, this uh, was found there, so it's probably something that was picked up. Uh, some of the things that were found actually are over in that case. A lot of the Native American artifacts came okay. from that area. Okay. A lot of them. Uh, we thought they were thumb scrapers at first, but these square little things were actually flint uh, oh. used to strike the powder for the for and, the flintlock rifles. Yeah, and the flintlock rifles. Okay. Uh, we do have a fur trade, a northwest in northwest gun or Indian trade gun that was traded by the British uh, and other trappers, early fur traders, friends, whoever, to the Native Americans for in exchange for furs and whatnot. And that so, one looks like it's seen a better day. Yeah, it was found <laughs> probably near a grave somewhere. It was found, oh, it's probably been, well, it came to the museum after we opened a decade, you know, three decades ago. But uh, it was found probably near a grave or came out of a grave, and that's why it's so weathered because it set out in the weather for, you know, 100 years or however long. So. We just did uh, the Dug Up Gun Museum over oh. in Cody. I don't know if you've been oh, over that's there. Pretty neat. He's got 1,300 oh. dug up guns, and, wow. and a lot of them aren't, aren't in this good a shape yeah. by, by yeah, a long stretch, but, but this one still looks weathered. Tree. So isn't that interesting? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what that means, but but you can see how it's it means that somebody it. left it right. is what I found out because I said how do people lose this many guns? Yeah. and he says, well, you know, they they were hunting and or mm -hmm. they just got too heavy and they had other things that they needed to carry and never made it back for them. Yeah. Or well, now this uh, it was used by an Indian, and one of the ways you can tell is because see those holes in the stock there. Uh huh. They would decorate the, their stock with tax. Okay. Last tax. And so the tax have been lost long ago with where right. that was, obviously with the weather, but you can see where those were. So that would have been an Indian used gun. Okay. And what's the story with the skull? You've got the a... The skull is actually, um, it's not from here, but it was from someone killed by, a, by the Sioux. Now the Sioux kind of emigrated here from Minnesota and from East and kind of took over this country from the Crow, which is why the Crow allied with the whites, of course, against them, because they want, were looking for an ally to fight the Sioux who had kind of come into their country. This was originally Crow country. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyways, the interesting thing about it, so it's just kind of a hazard, a demonstration of the hazards of traveling on the Bozeman Trail or traveling in Indian country like this person was. And this person, it's interesting because he has an arrowhead in his eye. And it, oh, is that what that is? And it's been calcified. So you can kind of see how the stone around it is calcified. So he and lived so he after survived. he was shot. Yes. with the. 
With a arrowhead. The arrowhead in so his So he eye. probably had terrible sinus problems, though. <laughs> oh, I would bet that that eye didn't work real right. well either. He didn't have a very good eye, and I'm sure he had terrible sinus, sinus issues. So. Wow. That is interesting. I was seeing that little knob, and I couldn't figure out right. what it was. So I just couldn't resist having that display because it's fascinating. Oh, yeah. Especially to show how tough people were back then and without modern medicine and... And, you know, it was a hazard to come out here or come anywhere where there was Sue, you know. Right. So, uh, so Well, I think it was just a hazard just to be, I mean, even with the outlaws and some of that sure. kind of stuff, I think yeah. I think it was pretty pretty right. rough. So after the uh, natives were defeated at the Dull Knife Battle, then the fort was reestablished. And so we have a lot of items from Fort Reno. We also have some items that were picked up along the Bozeman Trail, oh. you know, oxen shoe and things like that. And uh, so that's kind of this collection. And we have also have now, no, no, she's saying that there's an oxen shoe in here, but the oxen shoe is not fascinating to me. No, it's there is an actually a wooden one. leg. Oh, I mean, an it's actual it's wooden leg. Yeah. It's it's very well weathered. Yes, and it comes up to about the knee with the leg support that comes up above. That does not look like it would have been comfortable at all. Yes. But it has a, a foot shape on the bottom, and and the wood is hollow and comes on up, uh, like I said, to probably about knee height, and has some metal attached to it, mm -hmm. along with the leather brace that would probably go around your thigh. And I'll bet that guy, well, it, the, probably the lower end of his foot didn't hurt any more at all. But uh, I'll bet from from the knee down yeah. or knee up, it probably did because yeah. it doesn't look like it'd be comfortable at all. That was and found then, along the Bose, or along the Oregon Trail. Sorry, and you know a lot of these people coming west, a lot of them had been in the, the Civil War, right? Or of course, Bozeman Trail was a little before that, but. So, yeah, it would have been terribly uncomfortable. Here's a foot, a wooden foot also. And does it look like that toe is hinged? Yes. They, You've got another moves. one here. Yeah, that they move. The They're toes hinged. hinge. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. I thought that that toe would have been solid. You would think so. But, but it's shaped ankle, like a foot and, and the, the toes. hinged as well. And the ankle is hinged yeah, as well. Mm. That is just amazing. Yeah. I've never seen a true wooden leg other yeah. than, you know, on the pirate movies where right. it's just a peg that they're yeah. walking around. This yeah. thing here... The guy could have wore shoes, and you'd have never known that he had a wooden and leg, other than he probably had a bit of a limp. And probably was cranky because he was in pain all the time. I would imagine. And then you've got a really nice bullet display, mm -hmm. and part of a knife found at Fort Reno. You've got a McClellan saddle. You've got a lot of buckles, and like you said, the ox shoes. You've got another pistol here that doesn't have a stock on it that... Uh, it says was found at the Sublet Crossing on the Little Sandy River on the Oregon Trail. And then you've got a uniform. Is that Civil War or what, a cavalry? Uh, it would have been, I think, Civil War era, but it just goes with kind of the Fort Reno and the military display here. This is this is really interesting. And then a Sibley stove. I've never seen one of those either. Mm -hmm. And that must have been like for heating a tent? Mm -hmm. Yep. And it just looks like uh, like a great big funnel turned upside down with the door about halfway up and an air draft in the bottom. So pretty simple, really. It is very simple. Yeah, but probably would be pretty warm. We have a diorama of Fort Reno, uh, and then as you continue along, we have the Dull Knife Battle, some of the artifacts from that. Uh, we have quite a few bullets that were picked up. And you've got and some. You got a couple of the breech loading mm -hmm, rifles. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and some spent cartridges, a, a buffalo skull. Now, just... there's some great things that came out of that battle because a lot of those men that were, or a lot of those soldiers that were at the Dull Knife Battle had actually been at the Custer Massacre, and so they had picked up a lot of things from Custer's men. Like Tom Custer's hat apparently was reclaimed by the U.S. Cavalry or by the U.S. soldiers at the Dull Knife Battle and apparently ended up in the Smithsonian. I don't really? Know, but I don't have confirmation of that, but I'd like to find out sometime. So a lot of the things that, you know, we have a lot of things that have been picked up or found later years because we're a younger museum compared to, say, the State Museum or even the Gatchel Museum in Buffalo. And so a lot of those museums got all the really newest, I mean, the oldest, most uh, valuable things and the things that were still uh, in good shape. So we kind of have a lot of things that have been picked up, but we really do have some remarkable things. We have some that are really good too, that are better quality than 
in some of those. And we we did one of our first podcasts was at the Jim Gatchell Museum. Okay. Again, yep. it's a really cool museum. Yep. Now, after the Del Noy Battle, uh, immediately that that valley was settled, and much of this area kind of became the era of the cattle boom. Uh, Morton Fruin, I don't know if you've heard of him. He's, I have not. So he was kind of an English dandy, like a lot of them that came west to, you know, for adventure. And they were reading all these books about the cattle craze and the beef bonanza and how you can make all this money raising cattle. And all you have to do is hire some cowboys and drive up herds from, from Texas onto the vast plains because they're empty now. The bison are gone. They've been eliminated, obviously. Uh, the Indians are gone. And so they have all this vast gra grassland. It's not good for farming. We don't have enough rainfall. We don't have enough water to irrigate everything, but it's wonderful for grazing. And so this became this great cattle area. And one of the first cattle areas in, in this area, and Morton Fruin was the, the guy who started that. And he built what was called, it became known as Fruin's Castle. It was a big, huge log cabin, uh, which he had a, a mezzanine for, for musician to play. He had a huge dining table that could seat. I can't remember how, what the number was, but um, rugs and and mounts and horns and stuff all over the walls. It was must have been remarkable. So there's some pictures kind of showing what that right. must have been like. So we could have parties and have his friends out from England. And so he claimed this entire area uh, had thousands of cattle, thousands of acres under his name. But he went broke, you know, uh, just a matter of management and not really managing anything. And, uh, and what happened to his mansion? Uh, it was there for many years, but a lot of the settlers picked it apart and used everything. You reused everything. Right. Oh, yeah. So, cause especially out there, there's not a lot of trees. So they basically reused it. And we have a cabin in the back that is built with logs from the Fruin Castle. Oh, wow. So oh, wow. someone went and took and made a homestead with those logs. With, with those logs. And we have that cabin in the back outside. So, so when he went broke, did the land divide amongst a bunch of others? Well, see, here's the thing. A lot of these people who came out, they didn't actually homestead anything. And, of course, the Homestead Act in the West is limited to 160 acres, basically, which in this area doesn't really work. So you can raise about four cows on that. Right. So that's just not enough to make a living. So uh, what people did is they might homestead, like, on water and then graze the adjacent public range. So a lot of this really wasn't claimed. So all that land, he, other people just came in and homesteaded because he didn't homestead it. There's a lot of other people, especially as more homesteaders came, they homesteaded different plots, ran their own cattle. And so a lot of people came in in that time period, really from, oh, 1860, well, after the, uh, so it would be the 1880s was kind of the cattle era boom around here. And so they came in and, and brought up cattle or bought cattle or whatever they needed to do, homesteaded one spot, ran cattle on the adjacent range. Well, the problem is with everyone doing that, it got all overgrazed. There started to be conflicts between people who got here sooner, and they were used to having more of it to themselves. And all of a sudden, some guy shows up and homesteads on that creek bottom that they've been using and, and maybe winterize, wintering their pasture or their cattle at. Uh, and so there, you know, there's a lot of conflict about that. So people are feeling like, hey, I've been using that. You just came in. There's more and more cattle all using the same space, overgrazed. And then you have the great blizzard of 1886, where just the, the snow fell and the wind blew and just thousands and thousands upon cattle died. I mean, it was a huge, you know, reckoning for the cattle industry. And, and it made a huge change later to how people did business. They learned that they needed to be able to feed their cattle, get them shelter, take better care of them, figure out fencing so they can, you know, keep them under control. Uh, so that was something that tied into the Johnson County War. We do have some artifacts that relate to people who were in the Johnson County War and involved with that. We have a high chair from the Hess family, for example. He was kind of one of the movers and shakers on the invader side. Uh, we have uh, Elmer or A.L. and Julia Brock, their marriage certificate and a, a blanket from the family. And they homesteaded early and were kind of caught up in some of the Johnson County War stuff. They homesteaded in 1884 in the area. Well, now, from what I understand with the Johnson County War, since we're, since we're right in between, mm -hmm. the homesteading created a lot of the tension between the, the cattle ranchers, which you, which you uh, said earlier, were a lot of them were from England yes. or from Europe. Yep. Or and, back and all of a sudden, back their foremen were calling up and saying, hey, we've had a bunch of cattle missing due to the storm. Mm -hmm. And homesteaders are the ones that are causing the problems because they didn't want to be on the line for all the cattle dying. Yes. Part of it is them saying, 
you know, bad management, and so they're blaming rustling. They're saying, see, we've got all these rustlers around here. It's that guy over there who just homesteaded. How did he get those cows? Why, did, why does he have 50 head all of a sudden? He probably got them from us. And there's, I mean, there was a common practice of something called mavericking, which was kind of imported from Texas, where if you came across a calf and it didn't, it was weaned or didn't have a mother with it, you could brand it legally and claim that as your own. And so there was some of that going on, but the big outfits did it just as much as the little outfits. Right. So I, I, I think... You know, you could talk well, about then you also had you also had rebranding going on. Yeah. I've always been told that the best tool on the range was a loop off yeah. of a saddle, where you could take half of the loop or or change or any, the brands use, however um, you wanted to. We have, um, well, they're in this one, but we have some. They're called running irons. Okay. Okay, so they would carry that with them. It's easy. See how it has a flat end, though. And that and one's so made out of a horseshoe. Up. Yes, you could. He and I've seen a picture of it. I should put that in here. There's a picture of it with someone with two sticks. You can just gather up two sticks, heat that in a fire, and use that to brand something out on the range mm -hmm. so you don't have to have an iron with you. So that's an example of that. I would say, though, there wasn't a lot of that, you know, mavericking going on. I mean, a little bit, but not as much until after the war because then after the war, people are mad, and they are targeting mm -hmm. the big outfits. So I think there's definitely a lot more of the mavericking going on after the Johnson County War. Before, I think it was way overblown. Uh, one thing that I've learned more about in reading is just how much the media um, kind of drummed up the rustling aspect. You know, where you mean the media was like it is now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hate to say that. Yeah, I think yeah. it's I think it's been going on a long time. Yeah, it really was when you read the the accounts of you know what the public records say, and there wasn't that many cases for rustling or any of that. And all of a sudden, you know, the newspapers, just like the situation with Cattle Kate, you know, that woman was perfectly legal. She hadn't done a thing, and they hung her and got away from it. And that, I mean, the way that was played up in the papers is she deserved it. She was a prostitute. She did, she had it coming. And this guy was shady. He deserved it too. The witnesses disappeared magically. And so they had gotten away with it. And so they were emboldened to come in and do that more. And they were emboldened by what they saw in Montana go on, where they cleaned out wrestlers. Uh, Stuart Stranglers went around, you know, hanging a bunch of people. And so they decided they could get away with it in Johnson County. And so uh, that takes us to our Johnson County War display. Uh, we have, well, we have a lot. Uh, so before the Johnson County War, kind of leading up to that, and uh, there were some assassinations. And Orly Ranger Jones was one of them. And he was an associate of Nate Champion. First, they tried to kill Nate Champion, as you know, at the Hall Cabin, which is west of town in the Hole in the Wall Valley. And he was, um, there was an attempt made on his life. Fortunately, he fought them off. He uh, actually wounded one of them, and he grabbed Frank Canton's rifle. So they tried to come in there. They, it was a little room, and he kind of bluffed him and grabbed his rifle and was able to start firing, and they missed him. They went in there and started shooting, and they missed him. So, uh, and he thought he saw one of them who he thought, he was pretty sure he identified Joe Elliott over the roof of the cabin because it's such a low little cabin. And so he... Uh, he knew he, he immediately went looking to find out who did this, who was the group who did, was part of that. And he went to his neighbors because he felt like he needed his friend, John A. Tisdale, who was from Texas, same place. They knew each other as kids. And so he went to him because he knew he was kind of, he was really a respected man in the community. And he felt like he would be a good kind of representative, whereas Nate could be seen more of, he's a, he was a leader, but also maybe people might think he's more of a hothead or wrestler. Well, John A. Tisdale was considered very respectable. So he went to him and said, help me come find what's going on here, who was trying to kill me. Um, he also grabbed down the creek, lived uh, Johnny Jones and Ranger Jones, brothers who had homesteaded. And so he grabbed his friend, Orly Ranger Jones, or his uh, Tisdale's neighbor. And so they encountered, as they're trying to track down who was trying to kill him, they come across a man named Mike Shanzi. We have Mike Shanzi's spurs. Oh, wow. Here on display from the State Museum on loan. And uh, Mike Shanzi seemed to have been everywhere in the Johnson County War. He was, uh, it seemed like he was instrumental in so many things. This is one example where they encountered him and they basically forced it out of him to tell them who was the one, because they knew he was involved, forced it out of him who was involved, who tried to kill Nate Champion. So that made these two men with Nate Champion, that made them witnesses by the court rules at the time. Now it would be considered hearsay. But at the time, that made them witnesses to this crime. And so there was going to be a trial, an assassination or a murder attempt, attempted murder trial. 
and Nate Champion was a key witness in that. And so long has been one, and so would have Tisdale been one. So they were both shot in the back. Uh, Ranger Jones and Tisdale were shot in the back uh, not long after the whole dust up with Champion. And so people were pretty fired up. You know, they had people being killed who were innocent, who were not wrestlers. They were not known to be wrestlers at all. And, uh, of course, they, then the big cattlemen decide, okay, we need to do this right. This isn't working. Everyone's going around armed. Uh, this hasn't been very effective. So they decide to just get a whole posse together of 50 armed men and come up here and clean everybody out. And they have a list of people they're going to kill, including the sheriff of Johnson County. And they're going to do it secretly and quickly, just come in here and, and get away with that. And their only problem is they ran into a man named Nate Champion. And, again, Mike Shanzi plays a role. He steers them to KC, to the KC cabin, where he had been the day before, Shanzi, and he knew that Nate Champion was staying there because he was kind of out of the winter. They were kind of loafing there, you know, just kind of. Uh, it was actually the Nolan, ca Nolan cabin, John Nolan's ranch, and so they were just staying there with a couple trappers, uh, him and Nick Ray. And so once they knew that Nate Champion was there, the invaders decided that they needed to go to KC and make sure and get him because he was high on their list and so it the only problem is he was a good shot he was effective it took them a whole entire day to finally kill him and in the meantime word got out his friend jack flag we have uh, jack flag's chair over there okay and we have so i pointed out mike shanti spurs we have an a pistol from one of the invaders it belonged to Eli elias whitcomb uh, he was the oldest member of the expedition and uh, we have stuff from Hardwinter Davis. He started out with the invaders and then he realized kind of it was just a, you know, assassination squad. And he didn't want to be part of that, so he left. Uh, we have an original printing of the Banditi of the Plains, which was... That's an original yeah, print? Yeah. You've got to be joking. And so they're a lot more valuable because um, a lot of them were burned. I was going to say few. there's very, very yeah. few of the originals. That few. That's just absolutely amazing that you yeah. have one of those. Yeah. Now, the Banditi of the Plains, mm -hmm. it covers the Johnson County mm -hmm. Wars. It covers it from mm -hmm. the, the not the Before, invader side. Not, no, not and, the invader and, side. And the pref preface in that book, to me, is more interesting than the book. Yeah. Just because if you get a copy of it in paperback version, it talks about how it was written. It was confiscated. Yeah. It was stored in mm -hmm. Cheyenne. Uh they needed to get it out of out of mm -hmm. the state because it implicates everybody mm -hmm. from the governor to the mm -hmm. president of the United States yeah. in this in this yeah. conspiracy in this war, and they needed to get rid of it. So they broke into the Capitol building, they stole the book, mm -hmm. and on the way out, they tried to douse it, mm -hmm. and or, or to, to save it, they they broke into the Capitol, yeah. and then they and then they, 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 they took off with it, and they had. A, wagon, a couple hundred, a couple yeah. hundred prints of it, yeah. and they distributed it to libraries all mm -hmm. across the nation. And they disappeared all the time. And they disappeared because the state of Wyoming hired people to go and confiscate this oh, book. Okay, I didn't know that part. Of that. Yeah, and so and so they they, just, they were out actively looking yeah. for copies of this, and finally a copy I think surfaced in. California someplace in a museum and mm -hmm. then they were able to make the reprint. Huh. But all of that is in the preface of the of yeah, you know like is. the paperback yeah. version. There's a few around but there's not many. But, but the original have... copies would be very very yeah. few. Yeah. Wow. Well, and this is one of my favorite items. Uh, these were made by Orderly Ranger Jones's brother Johnny. Uh, he was the one Ranger Jones was killed, of course, assassinated okay. in the back. Now, Ranger Jones was kind of a blacksmith and tinker and and so he took these rifle barrels that he found on the Dull Knife Battlefield. So these are made out of rifle barrels. Oh, wow. And a silver tin lid that belonged to uh, Jenny Jerome, which was uh, when, or Morton Fruin's wife's... It was his, his sister-in-law. So he married a, a Jerome. Okay. Uh, Clara Jerome is Morton Fruin's wife. And her sister, Jenny Jerome, they all came out and they were kind of on a picnic and camping and ended up starting a fire. And so this jewelry box that belonged to Jenny Jerome was burnt up. And so Johnny Jones found that silver box with the initials JJ. Well, Jenny Jerome, just as another connection, she later became Winston Churchill's mother. So oh, really? A kind of an interesting connection wow. to a lot of people and a lot of angles from the Jones County War to Morton Fruin. 
Uh, but anyway, so we have those spurs, and I think they're pretty remarkable. They are really cool-looking spurs. Yeah. And this display case is, is really, really oh, nice. Oh, we have Nate Champion's rifle as well. Oh, is that really? That's that's really See, Nate Champion's there's, rifle. There's two kind of champion rifles. This one... Uh, see, his friend Ranger or Johnny Jones was a blacksmith, okay. and so Rain, or Nate Champion gave him his rifle to repair for him. So he did a lot of these blacksmiths were gunsmiths. They would fix guns for people. We don't have right. you know a gunsmith right in every town. So the blacksmith would do the work, and uh, it was when and so he gave him uh, Johnny Jones gave him his rifle to use because he didn't want him to be unarmed in the meantime. So uh, what happened though is that Nate Champion in the meantime was killed with Johnny Jones's gun, which was burned up in the KC fight. Okay. And uh, he, he ran out with the rifle, Champion ran out with the rifle that he picked up from Canton from the hall cabin exchange where they tried to kill him. But anyways, so, but this was held on to by Johnny Jones for years and years and by the family and given oh, wow. over probably oh, 50 years ago, given uh, to a relative or to someone who lived on the same ranch. So. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about the invaders, mm -hmm. because we, we, we were referring to the invaders. The invaders were not Wyoming uh, residents or citizens or whatever. A lot of them came up from Texas and from other states more as mercenaries. Yes. There was uh, half of them, at least, were hired guns from Texas. They flat went down there and sent someone, I think it was Smith, Terrence Smith, I think. No, no, no. He was the one who saw fight. But it was a smith that they sent down there to recruit Texans. And so half of the party was made up of just hired guns. And a lot of them didn't even know what they were getting into. They didn't realize that they were coming up here to just shoot, basically, homesteaders. They thought they were, they were really there to de they were deputize an official to go and prevent rustling and arrest people who were legitimate outlaws. And so a lot of them were very disillusioned by it when it was done. Uh, so And then there were, like, some of the foremen, the ranch hands that worked for the big outfits. Some of the... Like Plunkett, for example. Mike Shonzi worked for Plunkett. Uh, Plunkett was from Ireland. He wasn't around very much. He wasn't around during this. But Mike Shonzi was sure on the invasion. So uh, Mike Shonzi was kind of everywhere in this whole thing. So, <laughs> well, he's just an interesting character. And he lived longer than any of them. He killed Nate Champion's brother later in later years. Wow. Uh, so first one, you know, last one. <laughs> kind of, you could almost say he instigated, I mean, something, but. I don't know. There's more to it. but And then we have a lot on the outlaw period and some of the local outlaws. Uh, so They're not just local outlaws. No. These are the famous outlaws. Yeah, some of them. Yeah. The hole in the wall sits not far from here. No. And the hole in the wall, I've been there. Uh, everybody thinks that it's like a, a little ca a cavern or a cave or something. It's not that. There is a w rock wall that goes for, what, 100 miles, 120 miles? It's very, very long, and it's very high. It's probably three to 500 feet off of the where one plane comes into the other. And it's more or less straight cliffs. And the hole in the wall is just one area in that great big expanse of, of mm -hmm. wall mm -hmm. and it's the only place that you can navigate down through there and it's a one horse trail yeah there is a trail it's not a very good one i think you know it's just the uniqueness of it was that it was just a really good place to winter kind of keep cattle because you have mountains on one side you have the wall on the other you have kind of pinch points coming in where it's kind of closed off or with steep terrain or with a lot of rocks and so it was a good place to kind of keep things in there and it sort of did become an outlaw area for several reasons, partly because all the neighbors were just friendly to them, partly because of their experiences with the big outfits and the Johnson County War. Uh, there were people who based themselves there that decided to target the big outfits in Russell. And so they had their, their headquarters there. And in fact, that's how the name Hole in the Wall came about is one of those individuals. He was getting his mail one day and the stagecoach drive, driver asked him, so, hey, Al, where do you want me to put your mail? And he said, just stick it in a hole in the wall. There was a hole in the wall, uh, the little kind of cliff that ran behind White Bluffs. is different from the Red Wall. Okay. That ran behind his homestead there, right there at Buffalo Creek and Spring Creek. And so that was kind of the historic hole in the wall. And that area kind of expanded to where eventually people were referring to the whole valley as the hole in the wall. And there's kind of one particular area that the BLM refers to as the hole in the wall, or it's called the Outlaw Trail or Red Gap. There's various names for it that kind of evolved later 
uh, kind of more after the Outlaw Trail period and the, and the movie came out and Robert Redford and all of that. So there's kind of some different places, but it's beautiful country. There is outlaw presence there. Uh, there was the hole in the wall fight in 1897. We have Al Smith's pistol that was shot from his hand in that fight between law enforcement and big cattle outfit, uh, the CY Ranch, and some of the rustlers from that area. And so we have that. It laid in the ground for 30 years, which is why it's all pitted and, uh, pitted and rusted. And you can see where the bullet hit the ivory grips. Yeah, oh yeah. And when it was shot out of his hand. And and the Hole in the Wall gang was uh, uh, Butch well, Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and, uh, and a whole lot of the other ones that... Uh, mm -hmm. that Flat-nosed George Curry. Uh, he was one who was kind of a local favorite. Uh, there was also Kid Curry that was good friends with Flat-nosed George Curry, so I don't know if that's what Now, Flat-nosed George and Big-nosed totally George are different. two totally different people. Totally don't different. confuse them. Yeah. Uh, Two Tom different O'Day outfits. Tom kind of ran with that group, Tom O'Day. And then Al, and, Al Smith and George Smith, they were kind of local pioneer family uh, kids who were, kind of did a lot of rustling. They were kind of in that group. So they were also homesteaders, and so I don't want to disparage anyone who has, still has descendants around here or anything, but they were kind of in that group. So there's Flat Nose George Curry. Okay, right. Uh, so he was later killed, as was Kid Curry. Uh, which Cassidy and the Sundance Kid obviously were kind of in that group. They had did definitely retreat here. They hid out at the Nolan Cabin just down the, the street, uh, which is still right here in KC. Right here in KC, yeah, because John Nolan rebuilt his cabin after the KC fight, and he rebuilt it just a little ways away. And so that was a place that the that he was friends with the outlaws, and so he they stopped there after robberies and escaped the posse. Uh, there are several great stories about that. We talk about on our Hole in the Wall tour, for example. Uh, we have. When is your Hole in the Wall tour? Uh, it's usually the second Saturday in June every year. It's a and, big and fundraiser. Who is the leader of that? Is it still Clay Gibbons? No. Uh, That's a different deal. I don't know anything about that one. Okay. Uh, we've been doing this for, well, since we started. It was our first fundraiser. And uh, we usually have several speakers. We've had different speakers over the years. Lately, we've had Bill Bettinson. He's uh, Butch Cassidy is his great uncle. Okay. And so he knows a great deal about Butch Cassidy and his time in Wyoming. Uh, we also have Brock Hansen, who has his family was around during the Johnson County War and after, and his family knew, for example, Al Smith and Curry, and they documented a lot of the stories um, that were from around here. And know, what does that cost? Shootouts. It is uh, $90, wait, no, $95. A person? A person. Okay. And it's pretty much all day. We start at 8, uh, checking people in, and there's a continental breakfast, and that does include a really nice picnic lunch at the historical in the wall cabin site. Uh, and it's just, we have great, we hit all the really historic sites from the hole in the wall fight site to kind of overlooking the hall cabin, which was obviously Johnson County War, but uh, also the, the uh, Nolan residence where they hit out. We hit the, there was another shootout with a sheriff just west of town here. So we kind of, mm -hmm. the gent cabin, he did a lot of uh, blacksmithing for the hole in the wall gang and helped him get away with horses. He provided horses and we have his blacksmith tools here. And so we hit all of that. Um, okay, and that's the second week in June. Second week in June, yep. And you do need to register in advance. Okay. And it's through our website. And, and what is your website? Uh, hoofprintsofthepast.org. Okay. www.hoofprintsofthepast. Okay. And now the reenactments and everything for the... Battle of the Little Bighorn. Yeah, that that is, all goes on right in that same I think time. It does. I think yeah. it does. So, so if if anybody's interested in taking a really cool trip, yeah. that that first part of June that would be really yeah. neat because the hole in, or not the hole in the wall the the you could hit it all. I think Battle of all, Battle of the Little Bighorn. Mm -hmm. That's only another uh, seventy five miles yeah. north of here. Oh, it's yeah. it's really not that oh, far. Yeah. So you could hit this and hit that and yep. get a whole lot of Western history yeah, all kind absolutely. of in one fell swoop. Yeah. Now we have Tom Horn's bridal also, which is pretty uh, wow. a pretty deal. And Tom Horn, we, we talked just very briefly about... around the area a little bit. Yeah, he was definitely around here. It wasn't specifically in the Johnson County War part of the invader force. Um, there is a story that he was on his way over and didn't get here in time to participate. So... 
Uh, he he <coughs> ended up meeting us, and anyways, but so right. we've got quite a bit. And what was that. in this back room back here? Oh, well, we kind of skipped that. Kind of a homesteader kitchen. We've got kind of pioneer, you know, implements, and okay. some of them aren't as old as you know they're old, but. You've got an old uh, Singer sewing machine. Yeah, that actually belonged to uh, George Curry, Flatman's George Curry's sister. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And uh, the complete book or course in dressmaking and 12 lesson <laughs> book set. And just kind of a neat little sewing setup. You've yeah. got an old butter, a couple of old butter churns, yeah. uh, the wood cook stove, the cabinet, uh, just, a, just a lot of old type uh, appliances and, and things that would be used in the kitchen or in the sewing room or something like that. Now, we also have, um, so we have kind of our blacksmith shop and then we have the um, Mayworth store. These are the original counters from the Mayworth store and post office that was west of town. So there, you know, before, you know, when, when there wasn't uh, motorized vehicles, it was a lot harder to go places. So there were little tiny stores and post offices in the rural communities. So you have several different communities in the area. Barnum, Mayworth, Sussex had their own post office and store. These were the original store shelves or store counter and shelves and post office that was at the Mayworth community west of town, about 11 miles west of here. I was going to say, kind of what I understand is back in the day, they had towns or stage yeah, stops is stage what they shop, called yeah. them about every 10 miles. Yeah, well, they had to, yeah. Yeah, 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 because you had to water your horses, mm -hmm. take care of them and all that. Mm -hmm. But uh, all of these little stage stops had like a hotel or a motel. Yeah. They had a Usually. bar and mm -hmm. and uh, a place to stay, place mm -hmm. to water your horses, stables, livery stables, yeah. and all of that. So about every 10 miles all over the place you have – I guess they're ghost towns. They're just non-existent yeah. anymore. No, there's and nothing left, at most of them, I would say. But we do have that. Uh, we have and, and, and here in this display that she's talking about, we've got the old counter. We've got this really neat uh, spool drawer that had uh, spools for your old sewing machines and that you'd put your thread on. Uh, the drawer is really neat. It says uh, J and P Platts. It's got a, a key it's got a key hole right in the middle of it but uh coats it's coats it's coats okay jmp coats uh on the drawer yep. you've got some uh carriage foot warmers in here a meat slicer dutch ovens an old telephone these were used across the, the street at the uh, invasion bar an old cash yeah. register and that's then, really ornate. And this was used at the old early day grocery store at the meat market, the KC Willows. Okay, and that would have been that would have been the tabs year. for that everybody yeah, owed. For everybody's account, kind of yeah. a file yeah. uh, drawer. They've so got far. some old saws. They've got some old scales. I mean, it's just lots of neat old uh, articles that that you would be using in a homestead mm -hmm. that would have been at the general store for you to for you to buy. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a little post office. Uh, Mayoworth post office uh, display here that has a couple of the old post boxes. And, and then we kind of have our music room. You've got a music room back here in the back kind of <coughs> that has, uh, oh, you've got some of the old Victrolas mm -hmm. and uh, old uh, pump organ where it had bellows in it so that it would make noise. You've got a wind up record player, a little piano. You kind of got a lot of neat stuff here in the in the music room. And then a couple of of ladies dresses and and uh I won't say costuming because that's not what it was. It was fashion right. at the time. And then in here you've got some dolls. A lot of kid. This was a kid display. Some some of the toys back then, that sort of thing. Some of those are really cool. Yeah. A little Toys potty and, chair. Yeah, a little, yeah. <laughs> a little wicker potty chair. Yeah. That's pretty neat. And then you've got a lot of ladies' fashion yeah. uh, and mirrors ladies and items, some of that kind of stuff. Of yes. Very um, nice. Did you want to see the outside items? I, can, I need to go unlock that for you. There's the. Uh, Let's just talk about what's out there. Okay. There's the. Uh, Fruin Cat or the homestead made with Fruin Castle logs, and it's kind of unique because it has a bent night roof. Oh, and really? They would use bent night as because it seals out the water. Uh huh. It can soak up a lot and not go anywhere. 
And so that's something unique. We also have a chuck wagon that was purchased across the street at a general store. And it's over 100 plus years old. And they purchased it like in 19... 19- five I think it was brand new and, and it, yeah brand new it came from <laughs> Chicago and they used it on a local ranch for many years and so it's been it was in use and then we they it was fixed up and given to us like about 10 years ago uh, and then we also out there we have the original Casey school and the original Casey jail from the early 1890 period oh really yes and it had to be moved here to this facility uh, no, or the Casey school and jail were just right down the street and but it was moved over here yeah just a little ways nothing like keeping the people locked up right next to the school yeah, children it's the only jail that I know of that people have actually broken into oh really <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay what's the story behind that well there was a bank robber in like the 50s we this this little jail it was built with a bunch of old uh, spikes and then flat boards and okay just tons of spikes i mean like i don't know how many 20 kegs of spikes and so it's pretty solid and just a little one room deal and big solid door and uh, this guy in the 50s was he robbed a store robbed a bunch of places robbed a bunch of food and money and then he like broke into there and stayed there for several days until they finally found him there was a statewide <laughs> manhunt for him and then they found him and then he complained when they put him in the buffalo jail because he said he liked kc jail much better <laughs> so. i guess he knew where he was going but w- <laughs> nobody'd look in the jail for yeah. for somebody that's on the lam right. you wouldn't think well and then another story is that there was a big brawl and a bunch people drinking and fighting across the street at the bars and so the sheriff basically threw he had to throw the last man in like on top of all of them because he had to put so many people in that little tiny room one room jail so we had to kind of throw them in and shut the door real fast (laughs) (laughs) wow so there's a lot of stories like that so just but the original school house is set up kind of like a little schoolhouse would be with the stove and the teacher desk and the and the desks and everything and then that's all. That's all out there with some wagons and other items, and um, well, I might yeah. have to. I might have to step out and take a look yeah. when we're when we're all through here. Okay, you bet. And we you can bet. just go ahead and finish this yeah. up. Yep. Uh, now, do you have a display with Chris Ledoux stuff? We have a few items. Yes, I can show you that if you'd like. And okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about Chris we Ledoux while we're lot. at it. Yeah. Well, the Chris because Ledoux Chris Park. Ledoux is is who a lot of people are going to know just because. Mm-hmm. He did make it big time. Oh yeah, and he was the real deal. I mean, you know, he was he was a champion bareback rider, and from what I understand, he started out just after the rodeo, singing a song here and there, and and ended up making it to the big time. Yeah, he was he was great, and he was very well liked in the community. He married a local girl. That's how he kind of became a KC resident uh, many many years ago. You know, when he first was in the seventies, and so he raised his family here. Uh, he was actually one of the people who were involved with the founding of the museum and very instrumental he you know his idea for example for creating the different distinct rooms like the music room okay the bedroom and the blacksmith area so that was kind of his idea he was a big supporter of the museum big supporter of you know the town and different things and involved and uh, you know it's a shame to lose him at such a young age and well big family, supporter of wyoming yeah, period yeah, i mean and just a, a good guy i mean he, he in fact he played at my sister's prom for the kids because his son was in that class <laughs> really so, you know just stuff like that and uh his family all still lives around here and are very nice and the crystal Dew memorial park was built i guess it's been about 10 years it was dedicated you know to him to and they usually do a big crystal Dew days annual rodeo but uh, it's usually on father's day weekend but of course it was canceled this year because of everything but uh, that's usually a pretty big deal too yes, i know yes. my daughter has come over yes. for that she was well, it's really probably funny. the maddest she's been is i saw chris ledoux and cody when she was about four years old yeah. and we shipped her off to her grandma's house in portland oh, and yeah. she was so doggone mad she's still mad at me <laughs> because i shipped her off to to her grandma's house because her grandma wanted to see her and we went and saw chris ledoux yeah. I had to make it up to her when she was about 16. We did go see him in concert, and the guy was awesome. Yeah, I mean, the energy good. was just unbelievable. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, she came over for Chris Ledoux days mm-hmm. and had a great time. I think Cor Blund was here that year. Mm-hmm. Again, another mm-hmm. pretty interesting – it has a lot of really neat mm-hmm. songs and stuff. But Ned Ledoux, Chris's son, I think, is also playing yes, uh, a he's lot singing, with yeah. this. And he, he's very good. And he usually plays at the Chris Ledoux Days too, I right? I think so. Yeah, actually does. Yes. And yeah, what? And when? When is that? When is Chris Ledoux Days? It's usually Father's Day weekend in June. Father's so, Day. Yeah. So it's now, how? That's. I was going to say that's right there. close to your hall, hole in the wall deal. Sometimes 
this ended up being the same, but usually we try to schedule around it so we're not the same time. Uh, if we could make it work, it's just the same day, and so if people wanted to do both, it'd be just impossible. Right. On the timing. Because there's too much to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but it's a great event. They do a great job with it, and hopefully it'll continue after this year, I'm hoping, so... And yeah. The Crystal Dew Memorial Park is beautiful. If you haven't seen the bronze over there, definitely you should go over there and see that. Um, I think I have, but I don't remember exactly. Is the bronze him on a on a he's, horse? Yep, it's, he's it's on supposed a, to be him winning the championship of the you know the bareback champion or the bronc riding champion of the world. Right. In seventy eight or whenever that. The was. NFR. So, he, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Cool. So there's that. I mean, there's definitely things to do in KC. We've got some dining across the street and. You know, you can always take a drive out to Outlaw Canyon, beautiful area. Uh, we have driving directions here at the museum if somebody wants it. And we also have a self-guided tour with more historical information we're working on. So uh, there's just lots to do. And the thing that amazes me, back to my very first statements, is KC has all of this history. I mean, all of this history. And your town has what, 500 people? About 500, I think, yeah. I mean, the, the, it just <laughs> hasn't, it, it's just kind of remained KC. Yeah. It, it's cool. Yeah. Uh, so I would encourage people to stop by the museum, uh, especially in June, it sounds like, mm -hmm. is the time to come through here mm -hmm. and pick up on some of these other tours. Yep. Again, all of that can be found, and your website yep. is Horse uh, no, hoof, hoof prints. Hoof prints. Yes, it's a tough one. Of the West. <laughs> uh, hoof prints of the past. Of the past. Yes, okay. Some creative founding ladies. So it's www.hoofprintsofthepast. H o o f p r i n t s. Hoofprintsofthepast.org. Okay. So sorry, that was a little complicated way of saying it, but yeah, and we do. We're also going to start a maybe a kind of private tours program as well. That'll be smaller mini tours if people can't make our main one in june oh really uh, kind of a different kind of deal we'll see how that works out and kind of we're not sure on exactly uh pricing and how that's going to go but so if they were to contact you and had enough people to make it worth your while you maybe so possibly yeah. be yep, able to figure that able out to figure that out we're working on that so we've got a big year net plan next year and uh so we're hoping that's on the agenda but check out our website we've got it all there awesome okay laurel i really appreciate you taking your time today and showing us around your museum, talking to us about uh, Casey's history, and, and giving us a lot of backstory to what's here. So, I always say at the end that the world is full of wonder. People need to get out and explore. See what's here. Go visit places. And I hope everybody has an absolutely wonder-filled day. All the roll and go, where am I to go? Meet Johnny, where am I to go? For I'm a young and a sailor lad, and where am I to go?